Hello and welcome to the latest episode of High Resolution, Bite Sides Video Game Industry Podcast. Today, we are joined by Anita Mordoloni from Xbox, Director of Accessibility at Xbox. Thank you so much for joining me, Anita. Thank you so much for having me. Now, there's a lot of really exciting stuff to talk about because as we know, Xbox and Microsoft are really, really active in the accessibility space. So I, I want to start, Anita, from a personal perspective, what does your role entail and how did you find yourself in this role? Well, let me first start with your second question on what led me to work for Team Xbox. Um, previously, I was in Office and Windows here at Microsoft leading the accessibility efforts there. And then during the COVID-19 pandemic, I got to witness the true power of playing connection with gaming right here in my own home. The in-person and impromptu play dates and activities were no longer. And video games became that way to maintain the connection and have fun. And likewise for me, it allowed me to continue to provide that window to explore other worlds. And if only for a little bit of time, virtually step out of the house during the COVID pandemic. And so when the opportunity came to combine my work in accessibility and focus on play, there was no question at all to move to Team Xbox. So then in my role as the director of accessibility, my focus first and foremost is on continuing to put our players at the center of everything that we do and move the barriers to play for the over 400 million gamers with disabilities. And so we do that three ways. Um, enable accessible design and development. We want to make it easy for our creators to include accessibility. Second is to continually invest in accessibility by creating products and services for everyone. And lastly, fostering inclusive communities and providing support to make it easy to play. Because ultimately, and I think the best part of the job, Xbox believes that everyone should be able to experience the joys and connection and creativity and fun of gaming. And then it's my job to work with folks across Team Xbox and our community to make that happen. One of the one of the recent initiatives I saw from Xbox was um celebrating Disability Pride Month throughout July, which was a, a really lovely initiative where I saw there were multiple initiatives that happened uh, throughout the month, including new avatar, um, new avatar options for, for people with, you know, uh, as part of different disability and neurodiverse communities. And one thing that I was particularly touched by as someone who's recently been diagnosed as a neurodivergent person is that there was this really prominent banner on the Xbox dashboard highlighting games curated by the disability and neurodivergent communities. How, how did this come about in terms of the, the idea to highlight these games? How were they curated and why is this so important? A really, really great question. There were a lot of fun games on there, um, including Psychonauts 2, one of the games that I really enjoyed to play this past year. Um, to answer your question of how we engage with the community to develop this list, at Team Xbox, we have an established gaming and disability community, community made up of employees that have disabilities or allies of the community across all of Xbox and Microsoft, because we know that there's gamers out there at Microsoft that are outside of Team Xbox. So we want to include everybody across the company. And so when Disability Pride Month came up, we offered the opportunity to up to the group to share the games that resonated with them, due to featuring creators, leads, character options, or experiences with or around disabilities. And we found that was really important. This is, uh, addresses the second part of your question, because there are over a billion people in the world with a disability, which is about one in five. So it's important to us to make a gaming experience for everyone. So at Xbox, we believe that representation and identity in gaming matters, not just in the community, 
um, but that we also represent the world at large. And so by curating a list of games that feature and enable the gaming and disability community, it allows us all to come together, play, and be who we are and create a space to celebrate the over 400 million video game players out there with disabilities in the world. And another one of the, the major projects that the Xbox team has worked on for a number of years now is the Xbox Accessibility Guidelines, which is this living document that helps provide best practice of uh, various accessibility features and techniques for game developers. And uh, it's it's very it's it's very thorough for, for anyone who's ha had a look at the the document. There's so many categories and so many aspects to accessibility that perhaps people from the outside looking in may not have previously considered. So, how how did the guidelines come to exist? First, the ZAGs are Xbox Accessibility Guidelines, internal lingo, the ZAGs. Um, so if I slip that in later, that's what they are. It's, it's one of my favorite resources because of everything that you just said. There's a wealth of information. There's examples from games showing how these features um, show up well. And then it just brings a whole bunch of context to game accessibility. So the guidelines were launched back in 2019 after the team consistently got questions from game developers on how do I make my product more accessible? And that's kind of a theme um, across all the work that we do. It's largely community-based. People ask us questions, they ask us again and again, and we bring it together and end up creating resources and features because of it. So after consulting with the gaming and disability community, doing research, and then looking across the industry, the team compiled the Xbox Accessibility Guidelines, a checklist of foundational principles for accessibility. And as you mentioned, we continue to iterate on it. We had an update back in 2021 that provided even more context and clarification to how to ensure a developer's game is the most accessible. And I know that it's gone through multiple iterations and at, at the last time I checked the, uh, the Xbox accessibility guidelines or, or to use the, the, the lingo zags, the, the, the most recent version is, is 3.0. And I know there were recent considerations made for mental health in terms of representation and keeping players mental health in mind as well. So what, what actually determines the the future versions of of the guidelines and can you tell me perhaps a, a little bit more about uh the the recent additions made to, to the zags yeah absolutely let me start with your second question first so similar to the other iterations of the guidelines the mental health best practices came from developer feedback asking for guidance on how to create inclusive and accessible gaming experiences for players with mental health conditions. In addition to us just recognizing a need for the guidance of where we are as a society, especially in light of all of us going through a pandemic in the last couple of years, this, the mental health topic has really surfaced a lot more. And so it came to be because we know that game storylines and narratives commonly depict real world experiences, which could have a negative impact on a player's mental health or well-being. In, in America, there's one in five American adults that experience mental illness each year, be it anxiety, PTSD, OCD, depression, eating disorders. And so we created the SAG, the Xbox Accessibility Guideline, to recognize the relationship between gaming content and player experience. So for this guideline, it was to ensure that players were aware of in-game content that could negatively impact their mental health prior to encountering it in the game. For our creators, it was intended to bring awareness of what content could elicit negative experiences and reactions for players with mental health and then offer potential solutions. And the extra part of this guideline is for content creators. So for us, we were intentional about adding content right at the top of that guideline to warn people that we're going to discuss topics with traumatic events, phobias, and other triggering content. So you may not want to read farther if that is something that could trigger for you. So I love that it covers both our players, our creators, and our content writers. 
And the, the mention of content creators is, is a particularly good one as well, because I know that the Xbox team has put a lot of work in accessibility beyond the traditional in-game experience. And at the, at the time of recording this is, uh, the upcoming event Gamescom, I know Xbox ha- is implementing a lot of in event accessibility, uh, sort of considerations as well in terms of having, uh, people available on the ground to assist those with particular barriers, disabilities or needs. And I know there's also been, uh, sign language used in Xbox streams as well. Can, can you talk about the, the importance of factoring accessibility at all levels of gaming, including culture and not just playing the game itself? I I love this question because you hit home that accessibility goes beyond just the accessibility of the game itself. And it really covers all different aspects of how we experience gaming in life. So at Xbox, our goal is to empower gamers around the world to play the games they want with the people they want on the devices that that they want. And it really does extend beyond gameplay to creation, watching, events, communication, how we share the experience of play. And so we have many examples of um, accessibility features that remove barriers to enable people to play. And the thing that really hits home for me is stuff like um, the events or... Uh, like the like you're talking about Gamescon or ASL. And it's the stories that when we had captions or audio description or alt text or narration in an experience, people come back and they're able to say, I was able to experience this moment alongside everyone else. I was able to be there, enjoy it, and be part of the moment. And in some cases, be part of the moment with their friends, family, in the same room at the same time. There wasn't a multiple day delay or they had to hear it secondhand from somebody. And that for me is why accessibility is so incredibly important is we want everybody to be able to enjoy it at that moment and experience it together. It's that power of connection that we want. Yeah, that sense of community and belonging and people able to have that shared experience at the same time, uh, like you say, is, is so, so important when it comes to accessibility. Um, and another one of the, the features that I've really picked up on with uh, Xbox recently has been the addition of the accessibility feature tags on the, the Xbox store and the digital storefront where it lists these these are the accessibility features included within the game. Previously, I know the the burden has been on the people in the disability communities to identify whether they can play these games or not. And I know one website in particular uh, has revolved around that for a number of years. I think it's caniplaythat.com where they do accessibility-centric reviews of games. Um, so can, can you tell me a little bit about how the the accessibility feature tags came about and about sort of lifting the burden from the the communities so that they can make informed decisions? Absolutely. And you hit spot on the source of why we created the accessibility tags. We have heard time and time again that people want to pick a game and know they can play it. There are a few things more frustrating than finally downloading a game or buying a game only to find it minutes in, sometimes seconds, that you can't play it because it doesn't have an accessibility feature that you need. Or, I mean, I don't know if it's as bad, but it's pretty bad, worse, that you get 99% through the final boss fight and you can't finish the game that you just invested all this time on because some new mechanism was introduced. And so we wanted to make it easy for people to discover the next game that they could play all the way through. And we did it in a very similar manner as the Xbox accessibility guidelines. We partnered with the community, we had user research involved, industry experts, and we curated a list of criteria for each tag. So when you selected that you the tag would say for captions, you knew that it wasn't white text on a white background to be for a studio to check the box. Like 
you had a sense that this game was going to meet your needs because of that specific criteria. And it also helped our developers, our studios, to be able to say, here's the criteria I need to meet to be able to check that tag so more people have visibility into the accessibility features of my game. And another very prominent example of uh, Xbox accessibility is the Xbox accessibility controller, which that's been one of the most visible examples of accessibility from a hardware perspective. What what have been some of the, the, the best or most interesting examples of the controller that you've seen in terms of enabling accessibility? So the, the Xbox Adaptive Controller, it, it's one of those things that has so many customizations that it's hard to pick just one way that we that sticks out. Um, because our team works so closely with the community, we've, we've seen all the different ways that players use it to play and be able to use their equipment um, to connect into the Adaptive Controller. And while I can think of Quite a few examples of these specific setups. I think the thing that always sticks with me is that moment that once everything is hooked up, that play is enabled. Like they can play the game that they played as a kid or heard about or now play with a friend or their family members for the first time and just be lost in the experience of that game. And I think that is what gaming is all about. One one of the examples I think of with accessibility, I had the fortune of interviewing the Australian-based unpacking developers who, who we touched on earlier, and it won a local accessibility award here in Australia. And in the interview, one thing they discussed was that when designing for accessibility, it often benefits far more people than just the intended audience or for people with the specific barrier or disability in mind. What what examples can you think of with Xbox designing for accessibility, whether it be a feature or a piece of hardware or something else, where it's had a f much more far-reaching impact than perhaps originally intended? So many. And we probably don't have time for me to list them all. Uh, but I love that article. Uh, and it, it really touched on one of the ideas of inclusive design, the idea of solve for one, extend to many. And what I loved about that article is it really hit home the question to ask, is this feature like text necessary for the game? And does it create an unintentional barrier that could make it harder to play for other people? It's a tough question to ask because there's a lot of, I want to add lots of features, but I, lo I love that about the article. So we know that how people play and experience the world, be it virtual or in person, can change over time. So a few examples of some features that we really have to solve for one extent to many. So let's use the example of how you play in the morning may change to how you play in the evening after a long day at work staring at a screen. And so features like night mode or high contrast or larger text may be very beneficial in that extent in any scenario. Another example would be um, captions intended for deaf and hard of hearing. But after you've attended a loud concert, maybe a Seahawks game, if you're up here in Seattle, um, you may have temporary hard of hearing because of the like, how loud that concert was and you weren't wearing earplugs and and or maybe your partner or child is sleeping in the same room and you still want to enjoy that game. Captions allow you to fully immerse yourself in that experience. Um, one more example uh, from more of like more of a hardware perspective is Copilot. I don't know if you've heard of that, but Copilot um, allows you to link two controllers together, not like physically, but like virtually, um, so that you and another gamer can play them as a single controller. Originally intended in the scenario that if one player, one gamer needs assistance on the console, a second player could help and play along with. But that feature is also brilliant if you have a child that is old enough to know that the controller's not on. I can tell that it, they, they want to play and it's not on. Um, and you can play together and that smaller child that is now smart enough to know that the controller is not on, um, you can help them succeed at the game as well. 
I can think of many specific examples where that that co-pilot feature can come in handy from, as you say, uh, playing playing with children or whether it be people not so familiar with games uh, beyond the the obvious accessibility benefits that that introduces as well. Um, Anita, I wanted to quickly jump back a little bit because I know you mentioned that one of the inspirations for you to join the Xbox team was during the pandemic where you really encountered the, the power of play and, and people being included and being able to play in that regards. But I know you you have a, a rich experience with the, the Microsoft team uh, before before Xbox. Um, I'm curious what what are some of the the accessibility learnings or experience that you were able to bring from your time working with other Microsoft teams to to Xbox? I think one of the things that goes through all the teams at Microsoft, especially in accessibility, is really putting the player or the customer um, in the center of everything that we do. Um, a, a big part of the work that we did over in Office and Windows was around design and bringing accessibility to the very front of the process. And it's something that all the teams at Microsoft are doing now as well. And so being able to focus on the player actively seek out feedback, incorporate it in and iterate on that throughout the entire body cycle and just have those open channels to listen and find out how how do people play? How do people experience your product? It's one of the first lessons I learned joining Microsoft many years ago is that people use our products differently than how you thought they would. And the only way to find that out is to listen to feedback, be it hopefully really early into the cycle, otherwise afterwards, and be able to address that um, in updates or future versions. Certainly. On on that, do you think there are lessons that either the, the gaming space can learn from perhaps the traditional software industry or perhaps vice versa from an accessibility perspective? I think one of the things that Xbox does really well is focus on our players. We want, we're committing to making fun, making gaming fun for the billions of people out there. And it only works if we have representation in our creators and we hire people with disabilities, we actively partner with them, bring in their feedback throughout the entire process. So I think one of the things that we can all do is to continue to hire people with disabilities to be part of the experiences in creating those experiences and products that we want to deliver to the entire world. And what accessibility initiatives or what is next for Xbox in terms of accessibility in going into the future? That is a very popular question. Um, so we are on an accessibility journey it is one that does not have an endpoint for us. Um, so it means that we are going to continue to identify those barriers to play. We want to continue to make it easier for our developers with disabilities to create and be part of the community and partnering with the community, the disability community, to bring in their lived experiences. And so while I can't share anything right now, know that we're still on the accessibility journey and we look forward to putting the player at the center of everything we do and partnering with the community to identify what the innovation is next. So it's really a, a call out to all your listeners, viewers, to let us know, like let us know where we could do more. Give us feedback. Let us help make the game work for you. Anita, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. One question I like to conclude high resolution with guests is a very broad one, and I'm more than happy for you to take it wherever you please. Why should people care about video games? Such a good question. Um, so as a first, um, let me dispel a myth about gaming and who a gamer is. Like if you play 
or play games, be it Wordle or Angry Birds or Candy Crush, Lawn Darts, Halo, Mario Kart, Monopoly. I know, I'm contract only. Um, you're a gamer. Like, you play, even if it's like running around the yard with your kid and with the sprinkler when it's super hot. Like, you play, you're a gamer. And so, welcome to the community. Uh, so, why people should care about video games. One of the things about gaming is just, it's the power of playing connection. It came through so much during the pandemic. And we know that play has this, it's fundamental to who we are as humans. And it's something that cuts across all of us. So no, even though we all play a little bit different and what we play may be different, play connects us all. So if you haven't explored video games lately, I'd encourage you to go check some out. Because there's a whole, like, there's such a wide variety out there. Be it, like, hardcore games or story games. Like, there's a lot out there now. Um, but really, even if video games aren't your thing, I would just encourage people to get out and play. So it goes back to that Xbox saying that when everyone plays, we all win. I do absolutely love love that uh, that motto from Xbox. So uh, thank you so much for joining me, Anita. It's been absolutely lovely speaking with you and uh, I'm really looking forward to what the future holds for Xbox in the accessibility space. Likewise, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you.